Yeah, Global Connections. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. We're going to talk about world events in 2021. We're going to review the world. You know, it's only going to take us 69 hours to do that, but we're going to squeeze it in half an hour with Carlos Juarez, my, my co-host. Hi, Carlos. Aloha, Jay. Always a pleasure to connect. And well, uh, here we are. Happy New Year. 2022 <laughs> is now here. And uh, I, you know, I think it's, like you said, a great opportunity in this case, I want to step back and, and maybe share an overview of some of the most significant world events that happened this past year, uh, but also in the tail end, maybe take a look at a couple of trends that we can expect uh, here this coming year. I mean, a lot of it is continuity, but there are some interesting uh, new developments to be aware of. And of course, is, that, our show, is it interesting, yeah, yeah. like in the Chinese sense? Oh, yeah. Uh, you may you live in interesting times. I think we do. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Uh, but who was it that said that? Wasn't that Charles? Was it Charles Dickens, or I don't know who was it? What? Where did that phrase come I, I, from? I think so. But the people attribute everything these days to Ben Franklin. Oh well, he was a polymath like you, Jay. He was a man, <laughs> a jack of all trades. Uh, but uh, let me again thank you for the opportunity, as we've often had these dialogues, just to kind of catch up what's going on, and you know, we bring uh, public awareness to our viewers here. But our viewers really are everywhere; they connect all over the world. And myself, as I've spent many years floating around at times, and Think Tech at Hawaii is always always there to keep us plugged in. Um, and you know, on one hand, we also have to remember, you know, Hawaii, while we are this faraway place, I always like to remind people we are the center of the world. We really are a place that is both a gathering place, of course, but it's also the center of this very dynamic uh, Indo-Pacific, Asia-Pacific region. Um, and a region I like to remind people, it's not just Asia and the Pacific Islands, but it's really the Americas, you know, uh, all of Latin America, at least the, the Pacific side, the US and Canada, key players, and on and on. But let's take a moment. And what I brought, uh, I, I've got a, maybe there's a website I'll share as well that it comes from the Council on Foreign Relations. It's one of these, uh, you know, prominent think tanks based in New York. And they publish an annual, uh, you know, snapshot of some of the most significant events. I want to speak to some of them in more detail. Of course, we don't have, you know, hours and hours to go over all, but uh, I want to at least touch on some and 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 share with you a snapshot. Uh, so let me show, I think we have a list here that has just a, a, a quick listing uh, ranking them, not, not necessarily by any particular order, just you know from 10 to one. Uh, and I'll go through a few of them in a moment, but I'm just gonna first show them. The AUKUS, of course, refers to this Australia, UK, US uh, deal. And this is quite significant. It's a, it's a trilateral security partnership that was signed by the Australians, the UK, and the US. Now, the UK post-Brexit now looking for new friends, new alliances. But of course, these are three traditional strong allies, no doubt. Uh, but it's interesting because uh, it really, it's a, a big part of the deal is the US pledge to provide Australia with technology that's going to help them build eight nuclear powered, but not nuclear armed, submarines. And you may recall there was a big test with the French because they had a deal that they broke with them. And but more to the point, I mean, I think it on one hand, it underscores Australia as certainly a very key security partner for the U.S., no doubt. And, and they have a strong presence here in Hawaii, a, an important consulate that really takes on a role larger than you might expect in the small state. But it is because it's so much focused on security issues. Right. Uh, and so, yeah, quite interesting. So that's just one. Well, you, know, um, what, what, you know, what's interesting about that? And I, I'm not attributing blame, but I think the Biden administration has been criticized three times in the past year for failing to include an, a necessary party. Um, they ignored France in any discussions that's about right. this. Yeah. And that's why fr the French got sure. so ticked off about it. Oh, and later yeah. Biden had to buy the friendship back. He had to make another yeah. deal for that's other right. other weaponry defense. Um, yeah. And then he was criticized for not including, um, you know, Afghanistan and the Afghanistan pullout talks, which mm -hmm. I think was, was yeah. kind of interesting. Sure. And finally, most recently, Ukraine. He's been having all these discussions with Vladimir Putin, but but Ukraine hasn't been party to it. On three no. occasions, he has he has ignored the party primarily in interest. And yeah. I, you could say that that's you know that's the way it's done in Tony Blinken's camp, but you know it doesn't sound right actually. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, it's a fair point. And I mean, uh, my quick thought is that it reflects great power politics. You know, the U.S. kind of asserting its its sort of you know big power, uh, kind of doing what it feels it needs to do. It's the real politique. But of course, it can rub you know people the wrong way. Or in this case, uh, this 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 AUKUS uh, deal was put together rather secretly under the radar, and they announced it rather quickly without, in some ways, briefing everybody. So it came as a bit of a surprise and a shock, and obviously a very serious diplomatic crisis with France uh, that they had to 
further over. But again, it's it's relevant for us here in Hawaii because Australia, again, very strong presence here and a very key player in the in this region for security issues. Uh, let me move us just uh, again going through a few more, and we'll, we'll, we can stop a little more on a few. Some of them are going to be more of interest. Uh, of course, the migration crisis. I mean, this has been with us for some years, many years back in 2015. You'll recall the massive uh, European crisis uh, that they've confronted. But in more recent years, it has tended to be the focus on the caravans of Central Americans. But bottom line here is that while we've seen a downturn in some of the migration flows in 2020 because of the COVID, by 2021, it did continue somewhat, but it didn't go away. And in fact, we have some new issues. Uh, uh, of course, the US border continues to be uh, one of the areas. We've got other things like crises in Haiti, which went through a dramatic you know, assassination of their president and an earthquake, all of that that sends more people rushing abroad. And it turns out increasingly, Mexico is the gateway, the transit way for a lot of these Caribbean uh, and even African uh, migrants who are fleeing. Um, as well, the European Union has seen a flurry of, of challenges on migration issues. Uh, they've seen an increase of 70% uh, compared to 2020 in the number of people entering illegally. And here we saw months ago a massive crisis at the English Channel, right, where France began diplomatic uh, crisis with, uh, between you know, Paris and London over this issue. And lastly, and I'm going to move rather quickly, of course, there's been a tension in, in uh, Eastern Europe and Belarus, where you've had almost like the use of migrants as a political weapon, uh, forcing them uh, uh, to cross into the neighboring territories, putting pressure on the EU to end sanctions, so that in the end, you know, these are crises that don't let up and they just take on different forms, but migration continues to be a very, you know, significant thing. Uh, when you have conflict, economic collapse, climate change, all these are likely to drive those numbers even higher. So we're going to continue to see that, uh, and it played up quite a bit and was testing many of these wealthy countries, particularly the U.S. and, and, and Europe. Well, and I'm not sure that Biden has done all that well yeah, on yeah. immigration, on, on migrants, uh, and, and other, other countries that are much more humane than we are. Sure. And, and of course, you know, many were surprised that when he came in, he was not able to you know, immediately dismantle some of the reforms that Trump had put in place, uh, making it, you know, somewhat harder, draconian, and in some ways keeping in place this very controversial remain in Mexico policy for the migrants so that Mexico would house them. Because that took a lot of criticism, you know, the conditions, human right violations, you know, all the violence that takes place there. Uh, so, yeah, it is definitely a challenge. It's, it's one of these problems that, boy, there's no quick and easy solution. And at the end of the day, the Congress doesn't seem to have the political will for an immigration reform that would need to address many parts of that, right? Well, that defines yeah. everything in the Biden uh, package of initiatives. Congress sure. is not going to cooperate with it. Yeah, yeah, I know. And, and it's, uh, it's polarized, et cetera. Well, let's move on to a couple other items. We have the, the Iran nuclear program, of course. Uh, as we know, when Trump came in, he took the U.S. out of that deal. And so at least at the outset of 2020, 21, sorry, um, the year began with a lot of optimism that this Iran nuclear deal might be revived after three years after Trump had quit it. Um, there has been, uh, in fact, some you know, movement in that way. And, and, uh, and overall, it continues. Uh, you know, the European Union is also now rejoining the negotiations. So there has been you know, some movement in that. And you know, that, that, that's kind of back on the agenda, if you will. Uh, but as it comes to a close, uh, you also have, again, the off and on, the talks are on the verge of collapse, uh, and some are estimating that Iran is just a month away from acquiring weapons-grade uranium, uh, and now the Biden administration facing the question of what to do if diplomacy fails. And so while they're trying to gear that up, and even, you know, uh, I guess it's, what is it, John Kerry, the former uh, Secretary of State, who, who took a lot, leading role in that, he's got a role now in the climate change, so he's kind of still in the administration, I'm saying that, but... Again, it's looking, you know, like this is back on the plate. Remains to be seen if it's going to be effective. But uh, you know, well, it's, it's just another one of those issues where the Biden administration tells us. I mean, I, I really like him, but this is just one of those issues where it tells us he's got that's these quiet negotiations, and you can negotiate anything. Um, you just have to be patient and wait. Um, but we've been patient for a year now, and a lot of these quiet negotiations have gone nowhere. Sure. And I would say I would say that Iran falls right in that category. Yeah, yeah, and it's fascinating because I mean, at the end of the day, the U.S. as a big power has so many you know balls in the air, and you know at different levels and layers. Add to that the comp con con or the challenges of even putting in place some of the diplomatic core, uh, you know, ambassadors that haven't yet been confirmed, and you know, power politics going on in the Senate, uh, you know, particularly. Uh, people like uh, Ted Cruz and, and I think Marco Rubio holding off uh, nominees, that has been hampering some of their capacity, but it is what it is. Uh, let's move again, and uh, here's an interesting one that really speaks to 
the challenge of COVID in many ways, and that is the supply chains have faltered. And, and what this refers to, and now supply chains has become a bit of a household word. Uh, uh, for decades, you know, we've had a world in which businesses have believed that outsourcing production is the key to success. It's been going on now as part of this globalization. Well, the strategy worked and it has worked for many years, but of course, then came COVID-19. It exposed many of the downsides. We have shortages and stoppages that, you know, that create plugs in the system. Uh, and when the pandemic first hit, we had a lot of factories closing, a lot of inventories dwindling. We had shortages of shipping containers, backups at ports. You may recall, I think it was back in March, there was this dramatic container ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal. Billions, I think it was a cost of $9.6 billion a day that was being lost because of the, you know, the flow of, of, of container ships. So uh, this was uh, also a shortage that was most uh, focused on computer chips uh, that are used particularly in gaming consoles and car production. The point is that we live in a globally interconnected economy and suddenly something like this crisis of the COVID-19 ends up affecting the global economy, the supply chain all the way up and down the, 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 you know, the, the, the row. Uh, so, and it's uh, not over yet either. The oh, ships in you know, the LA port are still yeah. stuck at anchor. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And there was an article, I think in the Times this morning or you know, yesterday, uh, to the effect that there are empty shelves in the food stores now. So sure. we have disruption of supply lines right down to food, which have not been co corrected. Sure. You know, no. And the bottom line is that the, these disruptions have been caused in part by the COVID-19 and they've contributed to a, a surge in inflation worldwide, something that's likely to linger for years. So, again, it's just this underscores the interdependence of the economy, which brings us some positive aspects. But it also shows that, you know, what happens somewhere else is going to affect us here. Um, let's move on a couple other ones. The next one would be, of course, the dramatic uh, change in Afghanistan. The Taliban, who we ousted from power in 2001, they are back and, and the U.S. war has ended after 20 years uh, and it's ended with the same people brought back to power. Uh, of course, uh, at the tail end of Trump's uh, administration, he had struck a deal with the Taliban that required the troop withdrawal. Uh, Biden had ordered a complete withdrawal by September. And then, you know, we, we spoke a few months ago about all the drama that played out there. Of course, it, it, you know, the country collapsed effectively, or at least the national army collapsed. The Taliban simply stepped in. And finally, uh, you know, the U.S. withdrawing as many as 300,000 Afghans uh, who qualify for these expedited U.S. visas. Uh, you know, Biden administration has called it an extraordinary success. Obviously, many others would disagree. Uh, and his public approval ratings have taken a, you know, a, you know, a, big, a big hit. Uh, and we have even many other uh, allied, uh, you know, dignitaries who are, you know, kind of looking at it with a bit of, and you mentioned, you know, not even including Afghanistan at the table is a good, another example. And as well, many of the Western allies were a little bit upset that the U.S. kind of moved rather hastily. Now, it's, it's, uh, it is what it is, but um, you know, this is, a, of course, a legacy of this longest war the U.S. has had now on its plate. Uh, and uh, here we are now facing, a, you know, a new transition in, to this Taliban government, so far, it has looked and acted much like the one that horrified us 20 years ago. So a massive humanitarian crisis probably looms and, and it's not going to go away. Um, you know, That's very me... ironic, Carlos, is that sure. <clears throat> under pressure, you know, he did evacuate hundreds of thousands of people out of Afghanistan and um, and placed, the, you know, the great majority, if not nearly all of them, somewhere in the U.S., so they're migrants, they're migrants for, for whom we pay the bill. Sure. Um, so while we are, while we are uh, holding the border closed uh, to Latin America, not letting those people in who have been waiting for years during the Trump administration, we let a couple hundred thousand people let in. It's our own fault what happened sure. from Afghanistan, and they're here. Um, but the people from Latin America are not here. What, what is wrong with that picture? Yeah, yeah, no, again, it's a, one of the paradoxes and puzzles that we see. Um, no, it's a, it's a terrible, terrible situation. Well, Jay, for the sake of time, let's move in and, and put on a few others. I, I'll move quickly through a couple of them. The next one I want to mention, which is the list of number five, Ethiopia's civil war worsens. And, you know, this is a country that's had its fair share of, of heartache for so many years. And right now, uh, this, uh, you know, we, we actually, the 
uh, the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded in 2019 to uh, the prime minister for brokering a peace agreement with his neighboring country, Eritrea. Well, things have taken a turn for the worse. And again, I, want, I don't want to go into the details of it, but essentially this civil war has worsened and uh, we can probably uh, anticipate uh, right now we've seen 2 million Ethiopians have been displaced. And again, ethnic cleansing, massacres, gang rapes. Uh, it's just a, a story that has repeated itself in parts of East Africa. And, and we're going to likely see uh, the coming year with uh, continued heartache for this country that has seen more than its share. Uh, as, we, as well as Sudan. Sudan also yeah, slid yeah, back yeah. down. Yeah, exactly. uh, and they, sure. they were going to have a civilian government. Now it's a military government, as far as the eye can see. Sure. And we've had, I'll just mention aside, there have been several coups in, 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 in Africa, uh, in, in Latin America, some, some, some changes of government rather brusquely, uh, many of them more related to corruption scandals in a few cases, but in Africa, some classic you know, military uh, you know, uh, overthrows. Um, let me continue another very important one, which is uh, the number four, uh, the global democratic erosion. And this, of course, has taken place uh, you know, uh, really probably since about 2006 uh, uh, and, and continuing now through 21. Uh, the United States, uh, our own country, long the champion of democracy, democracy saw its own peaceful transfer of power disrupted as you know now we celebrated the one-year anniversary of the uh, January 6th insurrection uh, but moving away from the U.S. there's plenty of company you've got uh, you know other places even India this uh, you know government of, of Narendra Modi has cracked down on critics uh, prompting Freedom House to downgrade them from a free to a partly free uh, and uh, and so on. You've got Bra uh, Brazil's uh, Jair Bolsonaro attacking the legit, you know, sort of in uh, Trump style, hit the legitimacy of his own country's elections. Uh, you've got fledgling democracies in Myanmar, Chad, Mali, Guinea, and Sudan. All of them were ousted in coups. And so, you know, it's curious because years ago, 70s, 80s, you know, we had a you know, waves of coups were like the norm in, in parts of Africa, Latin America. It slowed down for a bit. Now suddenly we've got a almost like it's it's the latest trend coming back. Uh, of course, let's not forget China's tightening grip on Hong Kong. Uh, Cuba has continued to obviously uh, you know arrest thousands of critics in, in the largest protest that hit that country this past year. Uh, and this past month in December, President Biden hosted a virtual democracy, a democracy summit. Uh, and uh, you know, it, it was clear that uh, you know it was it was kind of puzzling because it brought together many, but uh, also some were critical of those that were included in it. But uh, maybe the general point is that we have seen, in general, uh, an erosion of democracy uh, in many parts of the world, including our own U.S. Uh, and we continue to see that. I mean, uh, the, the 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 data that shows us what percentage of uh, Republicans uh, continue to believe that the election was a fraud. It, it underscores the legitimacy of something, you know, as, as basic as norms of, you know, accepting the outcomes of an election, of an election that didn't have massive fraud, as, as some seem to believe. Uh, and, well, let's have you there. I call well, it the other virus. It's the other virus, and it's not limited to the U.S., it's worldwide. But I want to offer one thought before you move on to the next sure. one. Yeah, yeah. And that is that one of the reasons that a lot of countries were uh, experimenting with democracy, moving in that direction over the past, what, 20 years or so, it was because they believed in American democracy. America was the, the city on the hill, the beacon. Okay, and, and as uh, you know, the US has failed to perform in that area, has lost its, um, its ardor for democracy. Uh, I think other countries have been disappointed and discouraged. And they yeah. say, well, why are we doing this? It doesn't, if it doesn't work for the leader of democracy, it's not going to work here. So they capitulate to an autocrat. Yeah, no, fair enough. And, and indeed, as we look at, let's say, the last several decades, uh, there have been several waves of democratization in the world. And let's stop and remind our, you know, today, most people are living in more democratic societies than, let's say, a generation ago, uh, and, and, you know, more open. And yet those, those democracies are not perfect, and some of them have had steps back. Um, and as you note, I mean, with the U.S., which had long been sort of the beacon of, uh, you know, inspiring democratic movements and supporting them, uh, sometimes, you know, in positive ways, sometimes a little underhanded, but today it has lost credibility. Uh, indeed, when people see, you know, our own institutions being ransacked and, and, and you know, just the nature of what Trump brought to the dialogue, uh, uh, it has in, in some ways inspired other populist leaders to, to follow suit. 
So that's a challenge and it's not something that's easily fixed. Uh, and, uh, you know, well, it's going to be with us surely to continue. Well, real quickly, I'll finish the last two. Uh, of course, number two is listed here. Joe Biden becomes president. This was a pretty significant event. Uh, you know, America is back. Well, uh, you know, he made that point, uh, you know, repeatedly throughout the year. Uh, he moved quickly to try to fill his promise to, you know, strengthen relations with allies, you know, it's after uh, the years of, of, of the Trump administration that had caused more raucous. Uh, but basically, I mean, here again, uh, you know, uh, don't know what to say, but obviously the U.S. is back uh, under a new administration trying to, you know, um, uh, reconnect. But as we've said in different ways, you know, never easy, always going to have uh, some uh, uh, some challenges along the way, the bungled Afghanistan withdrawal, the clumsy AUKUS rollout, uh, even the challenge of, you know, the slowness of announcing ambassadors, which, you know, is a political challenge. All of that has been at odds with, you know, somehow, uh, you know, being smooth and effective. Uh, we've also got, as we know, politics defines everything. And now that both houses of Congress are up for, you know, contention in the upcoming midterm elections this fall, uh, many U.S. allies are going to have to entertain the thought that Trump and America first might return. Uh, I mean, it's hard to, you know, many people thought, oh, Biden is here. It's all over now. Well, guess what? Uh, uh, we're going to still continue to see strong forces pushing for, uh, you know, for that uh, that perspective. Uh, it's, it's hard for them to fashion a foreign policy with a country that is not stable, uh, yeah. a country where uh, the power will shift probably dramatically shift at the end of uh, Biden's term. Uh, yeah. He's not likely to be the president for a second term. That's the reality of it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so if, if the calculus for them is, uh, gee, what kind of deals can we make with the United States when we can't count on them oh, yeah. having the same administration for more than a couple, three years? Sure. Yeah. And, and it speaks to often in, 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 let's say, in the international relations literature and the academic world, we speak about how important domestic politics is in shaping international politics or foreign policy. And like you said, at the end of the day, countries are looking to us, but they're looking at what's going on in our house. And, and if it's, you know, if the house is broken, uh, they're going to have some doubts and skepticism about, you know, what we're saying that we're going to do. Uh, and so the U.S. comes, we want to promote democracy, but wait a minute, you know, take a look at your your own house. And that becomes a challenge, no doubt. Um, well, uh, quickly, we've got maybe just uh, two more uh, of these. Uh, the uh, number two is listed here, COVID-19 vaccine. Vaccines arrive as the virus mutates. And of course, here we've created, of course, we've been dealing with this in so many ways. But uh, on one hand, the speed of developing these vaccines was stunning, no doubt. Uh, historically, as we know, 10 to 15 years suddenly was all done within the year. Uh, but more than that, I think, and I'm going to speak a few more in a few minutes, uh, one of the trends we're going to see has more to do with uh, sort of vaccine pledges and politics. In other words, what the, the wealthier countries are doing to address it. But bottom line is that, you know, this COVID uh, uh, vaccine issue has been an important event for 2021. Uh, and uh, well, let me leave it at that because we, we've touched on it in different ways. Uh, the final point real quick, because I want a few minutes to touch on some trends for this coming year. But the final the world event of 2021 uh, would be countries fail the climate change challenge once again. And we spoke about this in the recent, you know, COP26 uh, uh, summit. Um, but here, uh, you know, we've got, of course, uh, challenges of many types, you know, record droughts, record flooding in parts, you know, we saw in Europe, uh, epic wildfires in Greece, some monsoons, massive monsoons in Nepal and India. So the world is definitely going through some climate challenges. Uh, they've come together and tried at this most recent reason, you know, meeting in Glasgow uh, in November. They pledged to take steps, uh, and yet pledges are not accomplishments. There's a lot of that, you know, promises. But uh, even even if Biden himself were to push through Congress uh, to address climate change in an infrastructure bill, the bottom line is, you know, it, it's it's easily picked away. Uh, and, you know, it, like many places, he's hoping to have his cake and eat it, too. But boy, it's going to be a challenge. Uh, and in the end, uh, the, the move away from fossil fuels is not, it, it poses difficult choices. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can think of even the Senate divided. You've got that senator from West Virginia who's, you know, defending the economic interests of his state, but as a result, holding back the ability of the, the party to move forward a plan. Uh, so uh, anyway, the transition, I'm sorry, you know, bottom line is the climate change issue uh, continues to be there. And, uh, Countries have in some ways failed to address it, if you will, because, you know, you know, there's a lot of talk, but at the end of the day, the political will is often not there. Um, well, let me stop on that. There are a lot of other little stories, but I wanted to just touch on those. And maybe in the last few minutes, uh, speak to, uh, we have another chart where 
I listed three of the trends that are going to probably be things we want to watch. And of course, there are many, many, but I'm just going to highlight these three briefly. And continuing what I spoke a few minutes ago about the vaccine, um, uh, I'm sorry, the COVID vaccine. Um, here, what we have is a world in which the donor countries, the wealthy countries that have the vaccines, they're expected to give roughly three quarters of the nearly 2.7 billion doses of vaccines that have been pledged so far. Uh, and so uh, you've got this process where although, you know, these, these doses alone are not going to close the gap between the poor and rich countries, uh, they will make a difference provided that they can go to the places that are needed most. And so, you know, you've got the major donors of the world are the United States and China, and they've indicated that they intend to solely address the vaccine inequity. But the bottom line is that we see a lot of strategic and diplomatic considerations, politics that comes into play. Uh, that's the nature of the game. Um, when you look at where these vaccines are going, again, from, from uh, you know, uh, let's say, um, in the donor countries, the Asia Pacific region has actually received a disproportionate amount. About half of all the donated doses uh, have come to the Asia Pacific, and four countries have received more than, uh, you know, more than a quarter of those, uh, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Pakistan, and Vietnam. These are large populations, and they, they are the ones that have been sort of most, uh, I guess, uh, beneficial, benefiting from it. Uh, you've got uh, others uh, in the region, you know, places like Bhutan, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, they continue to get donations despite having vaccinated over 60% of their populations. And even tiny Cambodia, you know, the 10th largest recipient of doses, they have actually fully vaccinated 78% of the population and uh, begun redonating some of their shots elsewhere. Quite astonishing, a cute story there. Uh, but the bottom line is that the US, China and the, US, and, and the Europeans have all pledged to increase donations this coming year. Uh, it will, you know, favor certain regions over others, uh, and you know, it'll continue to be this kind of game of almost like a, you know, a vaccine nationalism of sorts. Um, the second trend is interesting. Before, and, and, before you get off that one, sure. though, um, you know, it's, re it's really remarkable in that trend is uh, how many people in this country don't want to take vaccines even now, and how it's been politicized, and sure. how it's been, uh, you know, stuck in the courts, which is really ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, that didn't happen with any vaccine up to this point. Uh, and then, of course, uh, talk about American leadership. We have the same phenomenon going up in other countries, especially in Europe, where people want to oppose the vaccine. I think they caught that. That's another virus, right? It's, it's not a disease virus. It's a political virus. Uh, they caught that from the U.S. and they're emulating the U.S. And finally, the, another point I would like to make in terms of trends is uh, the more cases you have around the world, the more likelihood there'll be further mutations. We've already had several. Um, a few of them have been, you know, not not all that threatening, but we do have some very threatening ones going on. And when you have millions of cases, the probability of uh, mutations is there every day. And we may very well see something worse than both Delta and Omicron in the next year. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And, and again, we, we, we have so much unknown and these things are just suddenly confronted us. Well, let me finish with two last items, and both of them are in some ways connected to China, curiously. And the first is China itself, an aging society. Uh, as we now embark in this 21st century, China faces a massive demographic quandary. Uh, uh, according to most of the estimates right now, if the trends continue, they have declining fertility rates and a rapidly aging population. And this is common. As countries develop, they live longer, uh, but um, uh, the fertility rates are down. And this presents planners in Beijing with a real set of challenges. Uh, it includes a shrinking labor force, uh, a growing dependent population. Again, Japan would be a clear example where they've got serious problems. They've got to start bringing in workers. That's not easy for them. But for China, again, these are challenges that are going to basically affect them in different ways. Uh, right now, the most recent census they took uh, uh, shows that the birth rate has plunged to the lowest rate since 1978. And so there are concerns that there are now major policy announcements by many national and municipal authorities trying to raise the birth rates, lifting the cap on the number of children uh, that couples can have from two to three, offering financial subsidies to encourage additional children, and aggressively promoting marriage and family values. Uh, in China, again, the population is massive. And you know, on one hand, let's say in the last 30, 40 years, they've done very well to slow down the population growth. But now that slowing down and the aging population is going to present different kinds of challenges. Uh, I now, guess that was not predictable. That's, oh, that's a sure. rhetorical uh, question. 
No, no, it is. It's just you don't know when it's going to come or, or how quickly or what. But it's 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 pretty much it's pretty well known. Um, let me finish the last one. And, and it kind of on one hand, it takes us to Latin America. It's it's a topic of uh, renewable energies, which are getting a lot of attention. And, and Latin America and the Caribbean, they are today leading the world in hydroelectric and biofuel energy production. Uh, Brazil, of course, is the big player there. Uh, but the region is quickly harnessing solar, wind power, many different places. Uh, several of the countries in the region in 2019 pledged to hit a target of 70% renewable by 2030. So there's a lot going on, um, and uh, you know the rest of the world is, is not quite there. Uh, but what I want to get to here, what's interesting is that over the last decade, China in particular, but also Europe, they have had significant uh, investments outpacing the United States in renewable energy investments in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, the U.S. government itself, and uh, you know, has had some some interest in it, but at the end of the day, very little. Uh, China, on the other hand, has been making massive investments in in, in many of the parts of South America, in particular, uh, and given uh, Latin America, also Africa. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but looking just at this region in 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 the America south of the U.S., um, this is one of the few regions of the world that's best position to take advantage of large scale renewable financing because again some of it requires a scale that uh, you know not many places can do it uh, but at the end of the day again the US global leadership on this is is not happening in Latin America it, it's it's coming <laughs> curiously from China and Europe uh, and so uh, it'll be interesting to see whether Washington is going to prioritize more focus on Latin America's energy transformation that you know could help build goodwill that is we've got technologies and investments that could help them but it isn't quite on the plate right now. Meanwhile, the Chinese are arriving with you know suitcases of cash and then building you know facilities and, and investing in, in in a range of renewable energy issues. So uh, that's that. And uh, again, uh, just a you know super fast summary. These are not meant to be everything, but just uh, some of the things that we're going to continue to look out for. Uh, many of those things we saw from last year are going to continue. Whether it's the migration issue and uh, you know some of the developments in Afghanistan and crises in East Africa the erosion of democratic uh, institutions elsewhere. Those are things that will continue for us uh, and uh, just shows you the world, uh, well, it's never a boring place. Um, so always something happening. I'm wondering, let me see real quick. Yeah, okay. I think that probably is what we can bring to closure, a brief overview. Well, I, I feel a lot better now that you've covered those points, uh, but I, I have this recurrent image in my mind. It's a little hole in, in, in the earth, in, 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 in the soil, and there's a man put his head in there. And uh, that's what I, I feel that, you know, comes to mind when you describe American policy in all these areas. And the other thing that comes to mind, talk about China, is that there was an article recently about how you could take a train, a train from uh, Beijing to Lisbon, from Beijing to Lisbon. Uh, we, the United States, is nowhere near there. Uh, furthermore, there was a piece on, uh, I forget where, uh, it was a CNN recently, um, about uh, AI, about how China is not only catching up, but surpassing sure. uh, the United States in AI. And China believes, rightly, that AI is the future of the world. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, the old American exceptionalism, which you and I have talked about a number of times, uh, that's one thing that is in play right now and is it is not likely to be uh, as defensible at the end of uh, 2022 uh, as it was at the beginning of 2021. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Jay. Again, a chance to share a, just a quick overview, snapshot of some of these things. Uh, as we continue in this coming year, we'll come back to revisit some of these in more detail. Uh, but thank you again for sharing uh, just some quick insights, some perspective on global issues for 2021 and trends that we're going to look at for 2022. Thank you, Carlos. Carlos Juarez of East West Center and many other educational institutions around the world. <laughs> and uh, thank you for this very thoughtful and for my money, a complete discussion of the major issues that have that have uh, surfaced in 2021 and will undoubtedly continue with us in 2022. Thank you so much, Carlos. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha.